We'll um, start the recording. And somebody's joining. They're waiting for a name. And we have Amy and Rachel and Jessica and the NCSU group who is current have currently muted themselves. Amy has too. So we have we don't have a very big group yet. We can wait a bit if you want would like. Okay. Is is Mary Nabity here yet? I don't see her. Okay. Um, we've emailed a couple of times. I know she was trying to rouse up a a volunteer from Texas A&M, um, and I know Shannon is playing. Oh, there's Shannon. There's Shannon. <laughs> um, well, we'll be patient. Uh, yeah, that sounds good. People are coming in. Yep. OSU is a perfect fit for me because everybody's usually three to five minutes late, which is exactly how I work my day, too. So um, that's why I fit right in here. But I'm glad that NC State has a microphone capability. Here comes Mary. Okay, should we get um, started? Um, I think is that okay, George? Yes, I'm. I'm good for that. If you'd like, um, I see Shannon, the NCSU folks, Mary Nabity, who's muted herself, Jessica, who's muted herself, Rachel, and I are the only ones brave enough to talk. <laughs> That's no, fine. I, I think I'm, it, I'm it, teasing it you. Help, yeah. I'm teasing. It does help for um, muting um, because specifically on speaker phones. Um, I do think, I, I specifically do want volunteers. I know Shannon has volunteered for one of the slides. Um, but while you're not talking, um, it's best to keep yourself muted just so that there's no echo. But please, please, please unmute yourself at any given time to ask a question or type it into the chat box. Um, George and I have kind of talked about how this format has worked. Um, and um, everybody is always a little shy when teleconferences are starting and nobody really knows each other. Um, I actually can't put faces to all of your names um, yet since I haven't met a lot of you in person. So, um, you know, I know everybody's a little shy, but this is all about teaching you guys um, for samples that you may not see in your diagnostic lab. So this is for you. This isn't for me just to sit and talk about kidney on end, although I would talk about kidney on end, <laughs> Becca is looking at me like I'm lying. Um, so anyway, um, so this is supposed to be a very relaxed environment. People need to ask questions and people um, need to volunteer. So that's my um, soapbox for that. I do quickly in the next maybe three to five minutes want to talk a little bit about the two types of um, rounds we've already done. So we started um, the very first set of rounds and we looked at a group of um, non-immune complex mediated glomerular diseases. The first case that we talked about um, dealt with focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. Um, and again, that is a very well studied and well characterized disease process in humans. And we are just starting to learn more and more about it, 
specifically in dogs and um, a little bit in cats. Um, there has been a previous case report in a horse, um, but all it requires is irreversible damage to the podocyte. The podocyte sloughs, it falls off the glomerular tuft, and then the underlying portion of that tuft scars. So via histology, all we see is a segment of maybe one or two tufts that are scarred down have no capillary lumen, that entire portion of the tuft is now replaced by extracellular matrix. Again, it's a portion of the tuft, so it's a segmental lesion. And usually one lobule. Yes, usually one lobule. Um, and what that indicates, even though it's very focal, it's segmental on histology, it suggests that there is more serious damage to the podocyte that could be picked up on EM. So even though histology looks like a subtle lesion, there's a lot of ultra-structural changes going on in that podocyte, and that's why the patient presents with significant proteinuria. So again, um, I think a lot of people, you know, old school pathologists say, well, what's, you know, one lobule of one tuft mean and the entire context of the kidney, it's a hint to the pathologist that the EM is going to be very revealing and you're going to have a lot of podocyte foot process effacement. You'll have areas of denuded glomerular basin membrane and that's, that's the hint of, of what focal segmental glomerular sclerosis means. So that was one of our cases. We looked at amyloidosis. I don't think that's a very bad or a very hard diagnostic challenge. Um, but I presented that case because we do have situations where we see similar hints or suggestions of amyloid, but they're congruent negative. Um, and so some of those cases, when we do the EM, the fibrils are a different caliber size than amyloid fibrils. And we're just starting to learn more and more about those in dogs um, and some in cats. So again, um, amyloid isn't a huge diagnostic challenge, but always be aware that there are certain fibrillar diseases that are not amyloid. Um, and that's why you need EM, because you have to measure the thickness of the fibrils. Um, so those were the cases we did on the first set of rounds. The second set of rounds, we did immune complex mediated disease. And again, the key features of those are finding electron dense deposits on EM. Sometimes you can see them via light microscopy if they're big enough. And if there is significant remodeling of the glomerular basement membrane. Um, and so uh, again, so sometimes you get a hint on light microscopy. Sometimes you have to go to EM to get the diagnosis. And if we have the last person to join, can mute themselves for a moment because of the echo? Or George, can you mute them? Done. Okay. Just want to get rid of the echo because I can hear it. <laughs> um, that was you, Julie. Um, so, so sometimes you can get a hint on light microscopy, but the definitive diagnosis often rests on EM and immunofluorescence. And so, those cases that we described um, over the last, um, last set of rounds, um, some of them had deposits on the outside of the capillary loop, some of them had on the inside of the capillary loop, and that kind of tells you how, much, how many inflammatory cells you're going to attract to the glomerulus. If it's on the abluminal surface of the capillary loop, you are less likely to attract inflammatory cells. Um, if you're on the luminal side, you are going to induce chemotaxis of those inflammatory cells, and you're going to cause your endothelial cells to swell, so they'll be more prominent. And lastly, you're going to have um, proliferation of mesangial cells, although remember, keep in mind, mesangial cells will proliferate for a lot of different reasons. So, so mesangial cell proliferation is almost just like a band-aid for any type of glomerular insult. So, um, but that's you know how we differentiate a membranous pattern from a membranoproliferative pattern. Where those immune complexes are, are they far away from the lumen or are they near the lumen? Um, so this set of rounds, 
um, is, is now going into a, a, a subset of cases that are rare but are pathognomonic. So these, the reason I want to present these cases to you is that you may never come across them in your lifetime because it's such a rare disease but they are boards worthy because they are pathognomonic. <laughs> so, um, so that's why I'm presenting this set of cases. And I have one more set of rounds planned for June, which will be another set of these rare but quite classic pathognomonic lesions. Um, and, and that's why I want to present these sets of cases to you. Does that sound like a plan to everybody? Or just type yes on your little box. Um, for the people who recently joined, um, thank you. NC State. How are you doing, Tobias? I hope you're doing well. Um, <laughs> um, so um, for the people who just have joined, if you're muted, um, you please unmute yourself or type a question in the box. We're not trying to keep people quiet. We're just trying to cut down on echoes. But we really want this to be an interactive set of rounds. Um, OK, so George, we have tissue from a young dog. Could you go to panel one? OK. Um, Shannon, I know you volunteered, and I know you've volunteered in the past, but I thought you could take this case since it's from your institution. Would that be okay with you? Uh, yeah, that's fine. Can okay. you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. Okay. All right. So we have a panel with H&E, and, &E and uh, so I'll start there. And essentially the... The, the glomerulus is kind of lobulated and fills the entire space. There's thickening of the GBM, I mean, excuse me, the Bowman's capsule with uh, cellularity, so there's increased um, cells within there. There's also periglomerular fibrosis as well in this one glom. I think that there, well, I know there's increased cellularity within the glomerulus, uh, both mesangial, and then there's also kind of basically obliteration of any sort of capillary lumen in a majority of the, of the glom. Um, I think some of the cells kind of towards um, like the 7, 8 o'clock area there, um, oh, some of those cells might be endothelial because they look like they're within kind of a lumen, luminal space there as well. So for the PAS, I think it shows um, thickening there of the basement membrane, although mm. it's kind of pale, so it's not really PAS positive. But, um, give, give me a moment to get where I need okay. to go. I've messed up here. So, da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. You can't have to go back and forth between drawing and not drawing in order to um, move it. So, and you have uh, you can move that around again if you'd like. Okay. Um, so. Basically, again, this is showing kind of at the periphery the, the capillary loops or the, the um, thickening, I guess, of the GBM on the periphery. Um, it's not like obvious PAS positive. It's kind of pale, but it's still thickened. And then I think it highlights as well the hypercellularity. And then again, the Bowman's capsule at 12 o'clock there's kind of um, splitting of that with infiltration of, of cells in there. And Shannon, before we move from that, so we were just kind of discussing um, if that fits into the diagnosis of crescent. Um, and so um, ever, uh, I think we probably haven't really discussed crescentic lesions yet. We haven't, they're fairly rare in animals. Yeah. Um, and so um, the fact that you have cells in Bowman space um, and then um, and part of the issue of this particular cross-section of this glomerulus right now is we can't tell if cells are invading the basement membrane of Bowman's capsule or if they were hanging out in Bowman space and then a new layer of basement membrane got laid down. So this is a difficult... Mm -hmm. Um, lesion to interpret. It might have started out as a crescent, and I know you know, but can you tell everybody how a crescent forms? I'm not quizzing you. I'm 
trying to <laughs> show off how much you know about kidney. You're going to be my new kidney friend um, uh -huh. soon. So. So basically, my my understanding is that there there's injury, and so macrophages infiltrate on the. I thought it was on the inside of the of the. Yep. Uh, of Bowman Bowman's space. Yeah. yeah so Bowman. usually, a capillary loop of the glomerular tuft has ruptured. Yeah. Um, we don't often find that rupture. You would have to do serial sections and and often very very thin serial sections to actually find that region of rupture. But everything that would be in circulation now gets thrown out into Bowman space. So this, it looks like a crescent on H and E, but now that I'm seeing the PAS and I'm seeing that extra layer of Bowman's capsule basement membrane, it, it's really hard to say are cells just invading Bowman's capsule or were they in Bowman space. But technically, a crescent requires proliferation of cells and matrix in Bowman space. Does that help everybody with, with what a crescent is? Um, we do characterize and further subdivide crescents based on whether there's very a lot of cellularity, so those are cellular crescents, whether there's a lot of fibrosis part of it, and that's a fibrotic crescent. But again, that's more of what we've taken from human nephropathology. It's, they're fairly rare lesions in animals, and we just don't come across them that often. Yeah, so rats do have them. That's a good point. Dr. Falcon has pointed out about, about rats and pigs. We see, we see um, crescent, crescentic lesions in pigs, but that's just a, a little side. I didn't mean to, well, I actually did mean to interrupt because I just interrupted, but okay, we can continue. Thanks. Yeah, um, so I'll go to the, the trichrome if you want. And I think here, again, it just shows that there's pretty marked thickening, especially at that 7, 8 o'clock region, and then up again at 1 o'clock of the thickening of the GBM and hypercellularity. Here, it, again, I, you know, there's, you can't really make out very many capillary lumens, and there's a lot of uh, cells within what looks like they're kind of within the lumen, so I don't know if that's a little bit of endocapillary proliferation. Um, the parietal cells are, um, there's hypertrophy of the parietal cells and then maybe a little bit of synechia at the um, 4 or 5 o'clock, perhaps, although we're getting kind of close to the vascular pole there. It's very high, yeah. Yeah. Um, and then for the silver stain, I think that the silver stain kind of accentuates the splitting of that, of the Bowman's, Bowman's capsule there at 12 to 1 o'clock. And then the periglomerular uh, fibrosis. Ultrastructurally, there's obviously. But let's so uh, before we leave the light, let's okay. go back and point out that on the PAS there is some mm -hmm. very nicely PAS positive material around in here that uh, that is like basement membrane uh, here with, for instance, Bowman's capsule basement membrane on the outside. Whatnot. But but the material, a lot of the capillary wall is not very distinctly PAS positive, although it, it takes some stain. Over here, the material in the capillary wall, the thickening, is, uh, has the same tinctorial cap, uh, characteristic as, as the collagen out here in the uh, perimogular uh, fibrosis. Whatnot. So it's not just uh, the cellularity and whatnot, but the, the, I, I wanted to emphasize that the different uh, stains help you characterize the material because of what the, how they stain. You get over here again. Uh, this material is not is not taking up silver very well, although the same areas that were a bit more um, PAS positive and the PAS stain are. Uh, um, taking up or the silver a bit more. Uh, and so um, I just wanted to note that. So the ultrastructure for you? Yeah, so there's obvious fibrils in here that are measuring um, about, what is that, like 50, 54 to 56 uh, nanometers, the some that are a little bit smaller. I don't think this is consistent with amyloid. Um, and then for the immunofluorescence, it's 
positive. One, for... one other quick thing for the EM is, do you see the banding of the pattern? Right. So you've got yeah. a larger group here, and then I think an important point is that you have, I mean, we just say cross durations is our generic for, um, term. Um, and this is a little bit of an unfair EM because you don't know where you are. A, a boards worthy EM would have had a picture of the glomerular base membrane and then it would have had this magnified as, hey, you're in the middle of the glomerular base membrane and you have these large fibrils with cross-duration. So this, this EM is unfair because you can't localize where these fibrils are. Um, sorry, I apologize for that. No, it's fine. And then there's um, students by IF. There's it's positive for IgM. And again, I this is splotchy stuff that is really trapping this large molecule in in this material rather than an, an immune complex de deposit. And um, and again, this. You know, I think a, a board-worthy panel would have had the histology, and then maybe panel E would have had a low mag EM of the glomerulus, and panel F would have had the prostrations of the fibrils. The IF I usually put on there um, to show IgM positivity as a talking point so that I can tell everyone that just having strong staining with IgM does not mean it's immune complex mediated. It just means IgM is getting trapped. Um, a hint that it's just being trapped, like George has said, is the splotchy appearance of the stain. And another hint is that it's kind of segmental within the tuft. The This lower portion from about 6 to 9 or 6 to 12 or whatever is, is much stronger staining than the rest of the glomerulus. It, a true immune complex mediated disease will have a very distinct granular pattern and almost always it's global. Um, and it could either be on capillary walls or it could be in the mesangium, but it, it should be a global staining pattern. Um, so I usually add this IgM positivity as a talking point for when I show pathologists that there's times where you're going to see positivity and it's just trapping or non-specific or almost like think of it as a false positive. And that's why a lot of my fellowship when I did this at UNC was learning what to ignore on an IF panel. <laughs> so um, so this, is, this is more of a... Uh, um, a lesson for budding immunofluorescence pathologists. Um, okay, so I think you did a great job, Shannon. Um, I think that, uh, did, did you know what the disease name was? Um, I didn't, like, just offhand. I was looking up, like, in some of my texts about fibrillar um, glomerular diseases, but I don't okay, know. So I don't... We put some of these fibrillar diseases into a non-amyloidotic fibrillar glomerulonephropathy large category. Once I see the collagens being the size that we saw in alter structure, and when I see the um, cross striations of that collagen, that puts me down the road to type 3 collagen, um, just because I know that's the disease that happens in dogs. <laughs> so, um, so that tells me type 3 collagen, and the disease name for that process is collagenofibrotic glomerulonephropathy. It is a disease that's been well, or it's not well studied, but it happens in humans. It's been reported in a cat, it's been reported in a monkey, and it's been reported in a dog. All of the veterinary cases have been over the past maybe 10 years, 5 to 10 years. Uh, we have seen two additional cases. George, can you go back to the previous slide? Um, we've seen two additional cases through our service. Um, and the, the thing that always alerts me is that there is the dogs are young, and the thickening of the basement membrane has that kind of pallor on PAS where it's pale pink, but it's staining like normal collagen 
from the interstitium on trichrome. So trichrome will be blue-blue, and PAS will be kind of a pale pink. And again, the Jones will have that same kind of dense outline where that true glomerular base membrane is, and then a pallor where all of the type 3 collagen fibrils are hanging out. Um, this particular case was seen at Colorado State University. The dog was actually diagnosed with acute renal failure um, while, the dog, while it was being evaluated for a possible portosystemic shunt. Um, and so while they were in to try to correct the shunt, they decided to biopsy the kidneys at the same time. Um, and uh, they couldn't actually repair the portal vein because, or, or repair the shunt because of portal vein hypoplasia. Um, and, but they had submitted the biopsies. Um, the dog actually progressed into um, chronic renal failure and uremia and was euthanized um, with that for six months later. So the dog was euthanized at about a year and a half of age. Um, so they had sent us the original biopsy at the time of the abdominal surgery, and then they also sent us some samples at the time of autopsy. Um, and I, if you can go to the next slide, George. Um, so uh, this, is a, this is not from the same dog. This is from the second dog that we have looked at that has had type 3 collagenofibrotic glomerulonephropathy. So um, this is not the same dog, but this is an example of the fact that you will see type 3 collagen staining in dogs with collagenofibrotic disease. And now if you look at a normal dog that just has chronic kidney disease, has some degree of azotemia and, and interstitial scarring, that control dog has staining in his interstitium for type 3 collagen, but nothing in the glomerulus. A normal non-diseased dog should have really very minimal staining at all. Some of it could be in the interstitium, but again, it's just it's extracellular matrix in the interstitium. Um, and the dog, you should never have type 3 collagen in your glomerulus, whether you are a normal dog or a dog with CKD. Um, so the fact that we're seeing staining in both the mesangium and along glomerular basement membranes indicates it's type 3 um, collagen and that this fits into collagenofibrotic glomerulonephropathy. Um, and again, the diagnosis can rest either on the immunohistochemistry or on seeing that fibrillar collagen with cross striations on EM. Both of those are, are um, gold standards for diagnosis in humans. Um, any questions about the um, immunohistochemistry? I don't see any popping up at the side. So, um, And I actually should attribute the previous slide to Dr. Tucker at um, Rollins Diagnostic Lab. She did those stains. Oh, look, I have some, I'm speaking in French over there. Sorry, there's, that's supposed to be an arrow with the um, a, I apologize. Okay, so uh, collagenofibrotic glomerulonephropathy is due to accumulation of type 3 collagen. Um, there is some thought that the reason that it happens in young animals, and it can happen in young humans, sometimes uh, I think the youngest child to be diagnosed was two years old, is that there really isn't a proper changeover. Um, normally your, college, your type 4 collagens have a switch, and during, during glomerular maturation, and if they don't switch, that might activate mesangial cell synthesis, um, and then the mesangial cells might start to synthesize type 3 collagen. Um, so that, that, that's, um, that's one of the theories. And then the other theory is that you just have almost a type 3 collageno, collagenemia. <laughs> you may have just a systemic overproduction of type 3 collagen proteins, and they accidentally get deposited in glomeruli. Um, so both theories are suggested in the literature in humans. Um, and I think on the next slide, we talk about um, that in humans, that we know it, it really can occur in any age, but there are cases of two-year-old children with this disease. I think the oldest human that I've recently read was about 70 that was diagnosed with this disease. Um, there was a recent review, I think, in 2013 of this disease in um, uh, human medicine. Um, the human patients present with severe proteinuria. They may or may not have nephrotic syndrome. 
Um, and then the, the key is that you should not normally have type 3 collagen um, in either your mesangium or your glomerular based membrane. Um, but the mesangial cells have noted that they do synthesize the mRNA for it, for type 3 collagen. They just never actually translate that mRNA. So they can, so they do synthesize the mRNA, but maybe it just gets degraded. I don't know. Um, and then there are also other studies where they've looked at mesangial cells from human patients with this disease, and those mesangial cells have undergone myofibroblastic transformation. So they're no longer just normal mesangial cells, but now they're, they have the features of myofibroblast and they're making um, alpha smooth muscle actin. And these myofibroblastic mesangial cells could be the portion that's synthesizing the type 3 collagen. But again, fairly rare um, disease, so there hasn't been a lot of um, material to study. I think in humans there's only been, um, at least the most recent review, has only shown about 70 reported cases in the literature in humans. Um, so we actually might see this more frequently in the dogs, seeing as how we've had three case, two cases so far out of 1,000 biopsies, and there's only 70 humans, and how many renal biopsies have been done in humans. Um, uh, again, from this same literature is that the pro-collagen molecule, um, so the type 3 pro-collagen molecule, um, is increased, and that's actually increased in both CKD patients with just normal chronic kidney disease from, I don't know, systemic hypertension. That would be increased in the serum, but that if you have collagenofibrotic disease, it's about a hundredfold type normal, type, type the normal amount. Um, so CKD, maybe you'll just have twice the normal amount in your serum, but in uh, people with this disease, it could be 10 to 100 fold. So that's a good marker um, if we suspect a disease. Um, and they have looked at this pro-collagen peptide um, in dogs, and they had the same increases similar to what we see in humans. So it is a good serum marker even for dogs. Um, and in humans, there's documentation of a slow, and again, these are the pictures from the recent paper, but they do show a slow progression to renal failure. And there have been rare cases where you actually see type 3 collagen all over the body. So like we said, it could be that that's the one where it's systemically increased and accidentally gets deposited in the glomeruli, whereas another subset of cases could be glomerular focused. Um, this is the most recent review paper, um, which is cited there. Um, again, it's that same exact features we're seeing in the dogs. The histology is identical. Um, and I think the next picture, George, is the EM from this um, paper. Again, fibrillar collagen, and it's a little, you know, you, the arrow is pointing to some of the cross striations. Um, yeah, exactly. So that's, you know, the EM, but the reference, again, is in the bottom right hand, or bottom left hand corner of the panel. Um, Back to the trichrome for a second. Would you have other differentials for the rich blue material? Is that what you said, Tobias? Yeah, OK. Um, no, I, when I see this on histology, especially if the dog is young, I actually put in my interpretation that the, because I'm seeing such dense blue material in the glomerular-based membrane, this is my top differential. And I've only had to write that twice, but each time I ended up being right when I got to the EM. So that blue material should be collagen. If it's amyloid, oftentimes in amyloidosis, the dogs are older. And, well, um, not, I mean, not oftentimes. The dogs are always older with amyloidosis. And secondly, amyloidosis should usually have a, a pink or pe peach tutorial change. And I would have congruent positivity. So that's what would drive me down the amyloidosis route. Whereas having, you know, that same kind of staining in the glomerulus that I see in the interstitium puts me down, hey, that's collagen. Um, Amyloid will stain with a trichrome, but it won't have the same tinctorial property as out, as out here. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's the point. All right. Does that answer your question? Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so, uh, and the reason I brought this up, we do have two, uh, we have colleagues in um, Norway. Mary has commented that um, we did a review of 
uh, renal biopsies for the indication of proteinuria, and the youngest dog that had amyloidosis was two years old. So most of these dogs are in renal failure um, by, or, or are in failure by one year. Um, it, this particular dog I just showed you was euthanized by 18 months. Um, the other dog we have in our biopsy or in our um, database, I think, was like five or six months old at the time of, of death, and we have autopsy tissue from that particular dog. So, so these dogs should be younger than amyloidosis dogs. Um, and there are two colony, or sorry, there is a colony of this disease type um, in Norway with our um, uh, collaborator, Dr. Jansen, who is there. Um, I think they're located in Norway, but yes. there, there's a canine model of this um, disease, and they have looked for mutations in type 3 collagen. They have not found mutations in type 3 collagen, but now they're looking at other um, ways that that might be stimulated to have overproduction of type 3 collagen. Um, so there's a lot of active research. Both of these papers are one from, I think, 2012, and the other one's from 2013 or 2011. I can't see what that says, but they're recent, point being. <laughs> um, so good to know that there are colonies because that means that there is material <laughs> and people are actively studying this material. Um, so um, and I, like we saw, the human um, uh, h and and PASs and trichromes look very similar to canines. So um, it, 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 these dogs are going to be a very good model for the human disease. Um, the case suspected was clutch. It was four months old Labrador. Oh yes. Okay. And and um, uh, Tobias has also sent me um, a set of slides. He sent them um, last, I think, when I was still at UNC. Um, and it was a Labrador. And that was my best guess that it was collagen fibrotic. Um, we did not do EM on it. Um, and we could still probably take some of those slides over to Dr. Tucker at Rollins Diagnostic Lab. Um, and stain them up to see if um, it is type 3 collagen. So there has been another suspected case that NC State has identified. Anybody have any questions about type 3 collagen deposition in glomeruli? I'm very happy that there's more interaction. You guys are making my, my day, so I'm very happy about that. Um, OK, um, I think we can go to the next panel, George. This is also a young dog. No IF on this one, so no tricky IF staining patterns. I do have the uh, the uh, specialized IF to show the group. Oh, okay. good. Um, okay, I know Mary sent around an email to Texas A&M. Does anybody, or does NC State, since they have a microphone, want to take this? We could all do it together. Anyone? Come on, Texas a &M. You can step up. <laughs> Does anyone have a microphone? I'm not sure. I'm not. Huh? Go ahead. Can you guys hear me? I'll give it a shot. OK, sounds great. And can you introduce yourself? Yeah, um, I'm Amy Perry. I'm a second year anatomic path resident at Texas A&M. And honestly, I only got these like last night at about 9 p.m. So don't, don't fret. But Just tell us I'll what you see. Okay, so on the H&E, uh, what I'm seeing is that the Bowman's capsule is thickened, and the glomerulus takes up essentially the entire space. Um, I can't really tell if there's synechia, but at the bottom left of the image, the glomerulus gets really close to the Bowman's capsule. Um, endothelium, yeah, down there, so it may be there. Um, otherwise, I don't see very good capillary loops. They seem to have been obliterated, and the glomerulus is fairly hypercellular. Um, I can't really tell which cells are more in here at this point. That's pretty much what I saw on the h and &E. I'm moving. Give me a moment. Okay, on the PAS, um, we've got PAS positive in the um, Bowman's capsule where I thought it looked thickened on the H&E. 
Um, you can actually see where the capillaries are on this image, although they appear very thickened too, and they do approach and maybe fuse with the Bowman's capsule on the left side of the image there. This is actually the vascular pole. This is uh, okay. the tubular pole and vascular oh. pole, and, uh, and ultimately, it, uh, it, you know, glomerulus does have to attach to something over here. Okay. Yeah, it was just hard to tell where we were on that image. Okay, yeah. that makes more sense then. Um, but the capillary loops do appear to be a little thickened with PAS positive material. Um, the remainder of the hypercellularity or thickening of the glomerular tuft does not appear to be PAS positive. And that's all I got out of this one. And you, you can tell that a lot of the cellularity is out here with uh, epithelial cells right. in uh, in Bowman space. And here's some uh, protein droplets in, in out there. All oh, right. okay, that's what those. Are. Cool. All right. Moving on. Okay, I have a hard time interpreting the trichrome. Um, there is blue staining, so I'm guessing um, collagenous thickening there of the Bowman's capsule. And then in the actual glomerulus, there's a little bit of pink material in the tuft. Yeah, not sure what that is, but it's there. It's generally plasma insidation into the okay. angium or, or uh, capillary wall. Okay. Help me out here if there's something else going on. Uh, well, sure. again, you can see the protein droplets the protein. on here in the epithelial cells. But right. the, the trichrome doesn't add much to what we already know in, in this particular right. case. Okay. Okay. In the silver stain, um, you can see it outlining the capillary loops, which are thickened. Um, in a couple of places and kind of fuzzy looking. I am. I know I'm not using the right terms, but I don't do this very often. That's fine. So, there's, there's definite thickening here. Uh, the rest. The other thing that you get a sense of is what might be called wrinkling, which is generally a sign of uh, hypoperfusion. That that is a sort of the balloon isn't uh, blown up uh, very well anymore, so they sort of collapse down and wrinkle. Uh, all right. Okay. And the EM, my very favorite thing. Um, okay. So the podocyte foot processes appear to be fused. You really can't even see individual foot processes. And there looks like there's maybe a little bit of the microvillus transformation out in a couple of places. They're not really micro very much, but might be, yep. Yeah. Um, beyond that, the uh, basement membrane looks thick, and I can't see the layering very well. It's just kind of granular, globular, and then in the center there, I'm not sure what those are. Yeah. That's uh, this is cellular stuff. Just cellular debris? Yeah. Okay. So I'm not really sure what I'm looking at uh, here. The, 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 the pathognomonic lesion is the EM appearance here. Okay. Um, you, you First of all, you, you get oriented. You can find the epithelium. You can find the uh, abluminal surface of the GBM. We'll come back uh, to issues about that. But you can also find the luminal surface with the endothelium. See the endothelium through here? Mm-hmm. All right. So uh, th th this stuff is in the lumen, whatever it is. And the GBM itself is thickened. Uh, right. It's globally and diffusely thickened at this stage of the disease. The uh, abluminal surface is irregular. Uh, it's oftentimes even more regular, irregular than this, and and, and early in the disease, it's uh, the first changes are thickening and uh, and and splitting of the more prominent on the abluminal than luminal side. 
but then you get a sense uh, of if you, the, the, it's not really, really prominent, but you have a sense of, of maybe layers of like an onion uh, of uh, multiple, what is described as multilaminar splitting. It's not, it's just, you don't have that impression out in, in these regions right here, but you get it a little bit here and a little bit here. And, uh, and, and the next thing is, if you look around, all of the all the glomeruli, all of the capillary loops, all of them will have similar uh, lesions. So it's not you know in any one place. It's it's diffuse and global. And uh, and this is the characteristic EM lesion for okay. the disease. Let's see. Did, was there another panel, Rachel? Let's see. No, that's it. All right. While we're here, uh, and before I turn it over to Rachel, I'll pull up. Let me yeah. find it. Here. And can you mute? Um, we're having echo over here. Um, we had a question at Ohio State about whether or not there are electron um, dense deposits um, on the abluminal surface. And that is actually condensed actin filaments from the podocyte. So all the right. dark electron dense areas are actin filaments. They are not deposits. That, that, that's where we're talking about, right? Okay. Um, so this is um, the immunostaining panel with not um, regular uh, IgG, IgM staining and whatnot, but this is with a monoclonal antibody for uh, the alpha-1 chain of type 4 collagen, the alpha-3 chain, and the alpha-5 chain. This is a normal control dog. It's positive in the capillary walls for Ig, excuse me, I misspoke, for alpha-1 chain. It's also positive in the affected dog, and the thickened basement membranes are, you know, more positive than the normal base. It's, it's, it's not very prominent. What is most prominent in normal is if alpha-3 staining uh, of type 4 collagen and alpha-5, and, uh, and the key point here is that this dog is dark side of the moon negative for alpha-3. If you stain for alpha-4, uh, it would also be uh, negative. And um, in, it's an interesting feature in dogs, but they're not totally negative for alpha-5. And, and the, uh, we'll, we'll look in a moment of how the collagens are assembled. But the, the alpha-5 in this uh, abnormal glomerulus is actually in trimers with the alpha-6 chain uh, not the three. Uh, it's not the three, four, five chain that is normal, and so it. it the the definitive diagnosis is uh, demonstrated by the total absence of uh, alpha three chain in the glomerulus. Okay, and we'll so go. Uh, the name of the disease is Alport's disease. Um, or hereditary nephritis, is that what you call it, George? We call, well, it, it, the, the disease has a long sort of convoluted history in, in naming. People called it, before before they worked out exactly what it was, it, it was even in the human literature as hereditary nephritis. It's not fundamentally inflammatory, so I have not liked to call it hereditary nephritis. I've called it hereditary nephropathy, which then makes it a name that's so general nobody likes it, but, you know. Uh, you can call it canine Alport syndrome, but uh, yeah, in dogs, know. the hearing loss and ocular lesions are not very prominent, and so the full Alport syndrome is uh, is hard to think. So, but it, it, it's a -like. it's Alport-like nephropathy. Yeah. Um, and so this, the history for this case um, is a 10-month-old female uh, Springer Spaniel. Both she and her litter mate were noted to be. Um, borderline to mildly azotemic, and they were doing pre-anesthetic blood workup prior to spaying, I think, spaying. Um, that was and, the plan. Okay, and so at that time, um, uh, we, they knew that she had abnormal renal values. Uh, they followed her clinically. 
She progressed, um, both she and the other litter mate were progressed to severe azotemia, um, and they were both euthanized basically when they were a little bit over a year old. Um, we got samples from both dogs, and um, George is, um, this is his um, uh, expert of disease, and so they happen to be at the right place for, for all of the uh, amazing studies to be done and to do EM. Um, and to do the type 4 collagen staining. Um, I think if they had been in another institution, they may not have gotten the full workup. And so I think it's great that, you know, um, we have these cases to capture in our database. Um, I have two images that came from um, this, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine, again, about how collagen is synthesized. Um, so uh, we've already talked about how type 3 collagen should not be in the glomerulus. Type 4 collagen is the uh, mainstay uh, collagen, especially for the glomerular basement membrane. Um, fetal glomeruli have a different um, um, isotype for their type 4 collagen, and it switches over during glomerular maturation. Um, and this is um, the, uh, you know, you could put a whole bunch of different trimers together and make a, a lot of different type 4 collagen. Um, and like George says, there's the 345, which is the typical one in the adult glomerulus, um, but you, we also see a lot of um, the alpha-6 chain, especially in dogs, and, and, and so dogs might have a little bit of a variation that, you, not very, it might, it might be a little bit variable from what we normally see in humans. Um, I think the next slide um, has a, a, a very good uh, image, and again, the citation is down at the bottom for you guys to have this information, um, but you, you normally have in an immature glomerulus a different set of collagen fiber, or protomers to, to make those type 4 collagens in the immature glomerulus, and then it should switch during glomerular maturation to the 3, 4, 5, and that failure of switch might be why these dogs present at the age that they present. Um, and so, uh, the, so everybody can kind of go through this diagram, and I think the next slide... Um, I, I let let me go talk. back. One, one quick thing. The genes that synthesize these protomers, these, these two are on the X chromosome. These are on two different autosomes. So, and the genes that can mess up and make alpha syndrome are alpha 3, 4, or 5. When it's the alpha-5 gene, it's inherited in the X-link pattern. When it's the 3 or 4, it's inherited in the autosomal, generally autosomal recessive pattern. And it is th uh, this trimer that is assembled head-to-head -head and tail-to-tail -tail into a network that is not shown here. And it is this network like fishnet or um, chicken wire uh, in the basement membrane. And it has to be made out of this stuff in order for the mature glomerular basement membrane uh, to hold up under conditions of normal use. The pathogenesis of the changes and whatnot is, uh, is an open question, uh, but uh, if you have uh, this instead of this, that you will end up with um, uh, deterioration uh, the, and Alport syndrome nephropathy. Yeah. Um, and so just a quick comparison for what we see in humans. Um, they usually have present with a long-standing history of microhematuria, um, and they usually don't develop proteinuria until kind of late stage in disease, and that's usually associated with having glomerulosclerosis. Um, on human biopsies, I often saw mesangial expansion. Um, sometimes I would see hypercellularity. Um, but the, one of the key features in humans is actually these interstitial foamy macrophages. And that would put me down the road of, hey, this could be Alport's. I need to do the special IS stain that, that George just showed us a picture of. Um, so it doesn't seem to be the similar histopathologic for, uh, feature in, in dogs because I don't, we don't recognize those same kind of interstitial foam cells. And then again, dogs don't usually have um, that longstanding history of hematuria or microhematuria. They usually just present with proteinuria. So there is a variation in the disease clinical workup compared um, dogs and humans. Um, and I think the next 
side. FYI, they do have m microscopic hematuria, but they have much more proteinuria earlier in the disease than uh, than people, and and that is in dogs the pathognomonic feature. So that that's a good question. Um, uh, NC State had about what about the tubular basement membrane? Um, we we see tubular damage, but it's we suspect it's more because of the proteinuria. Um, and in um, Mary and I have looked at a lot of these dogs, um, and she's looked at them with urinary biomarker, and I've looked at the um, histology. Um, there there is a possibility that. Uh, they have a lot more dilated Bowman's capsules, and that could be because type 4 collagen should be part of Bowman's capsule basement membrane. Um, and then the tubular dilation, we're not sure if that's due to abnormal type 4 collagen expression, so not having the normal college, type 4 collagen constituents, or if it's because they're overtly proteinuric and proteinuria damages tubules. So again, that needs to be worked out pathogenesis-wise. Um, it, I the, the, the papers that about the cockers, uh, particularly uh, the KI paper, and the uh, paper about the mixed breed dogs we call Navasota dogs. It's in AJ, uh, AJVR. Each of those have uh, detailed information about the staining of not just glomerular uh, uh, GBM and Bowman's capsule basement membranes but also tubular basement membranes with all of the collagens. And, uh, and so for, for your questions about how they're expressed, in, that, that information is, is in the published papers. In general, there's not a sense that the abnormal uh, tubular basement membrane leads to primary changes in directly in uh, tubular uh, morphology or function. Similarly, for instance, the epidermal basement membrane in the dogs uh, is in excellent dog is abnormal. Uh, we use that actually and can be used in immunostaining as a diagnostic test, but um, there's no dermatopathy. So uh, just having a different basement membrane composition does not necessarily lead to uh, pathologic changes in the overlying epithelial uh, endothelial areas, uh, but um, uh, it, it's not, a, not for sure that it has no effect at all in, in renal tubules. And what was your next question, Jeremy? Huh? Did you, did you the oh, the human tubules? Uh, again, it's usually, um, uh, I guess in humans, the, the glomerular features are so striking that I, you, you kind of look over the tubules. There can be um, loss of the brush border, and you can have some um, protein casts. Um, but often we see red blood cell casts as well. Um, so again, the tubules are not striking features of this lesion. It's, it's really the glomerulus, and it's really that EM, um, that, that basket weaving on the EM that, that tells us that. And, I have and a few the, the pictures that... Have. The pictures that we've shown you from this, this case, these were end-stage kidneys in these dogs yep. who went. If you do biopsies, and, and some of that information is in the papers and whatnot, you, you can do uh, biopsies early enough that the light microscopy is essentially uh, negligible lesions. And, yep. uh, and so uh, it, it, when you look at that stage of things, uh, the, the kidney looks pretty healthy except uh, at the EM level in the glomerular capillary wall. Um, and so I just have a couple of really quick photos which I think are just a striking glomerular base membrane opathy. Um, and so we can go through these in 30 seconds um, just to show you so, I mean, some of these will, a lot, the PowerPoint again will be sent out as a PDF. I can't send out all of these pictures because some of them are being written up for publication, um, so they're not available yet for you guys. But you can participate in this conference and look at how strikingly abnormal glomerular basement membrane can get. And we, this is a particular cat. Um, it actually wasn't even that proteinuric, um, but pretty much every glomerulus looked like this. And, oh, hold on, our computer froze one second. George, I think you can go to the next. Or the next slide, sorry. 
Um, this is the silver stain from that exact same cat I just showed you the EM. And you can see these spike-like projections, but they are really weirdly looking. They don't look like normal spikes that you would see in a membranous glomerular nephropathy. They're quite large. They're sometimes nodular, and they're very irregularly distributed. So this was the cat uh, Jones stain that matched the EM I just showed you. The next uh, image is another really cool Yorkie, um, I think. Oh, did it not come up? Uh, uh, oh, is that the end? Um, of that one. I'll pull up the other one. Just uh, so the, it's okay. I can always send it no, around. No, 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 no. Let me. It may not have. Maybe I dragged and clicked and not. Well, I have both the ones you sent me, and oh. th so that was the second one. I think it's in the first one. It's loading. Okay. Again, just some striking. Um, glomerular based membrane lesions. And if... We'll get there. <laughs> okay, so this is from a Yorkie. Um, and actually I see this somewhat frequently in Yorkies where they have um, a um, expansion with, it, it does even have some type of lamination, but if you go to higher mag, which I think the next image might show, George, it actually looks um, a little bubbly. Do you guys appreciate the bubbles, especially kind of near the mesangial supporting zone and right where George is pointing? I don't know what that means. I scoped this case yesterday. I pulled the OSU MD folks into the room. I say, I see this a lot in your keys, and I don't know what it means. And they said, wow, that's the coolest thing I've ever seen. We don't know what it means either. Um, but they are very interested as well. And I think there might be one more EM from this case, George. Yeah, so again, it just highlights that it's bubbly. Like, it's, again, so uh, coming to a veterinary pathology journal near you, hopefully within the next couple of years, so I can finally get these things off my desk. Um, but these dogs, um, and this, the, this dog was biopsied for uh, March partneria, um, so it obviously affects uh, glomerular permeability. Um, and maybe it is some kind of genetic mutation that is a dog thing, and we don't have a, a correlate in, in human medicine. Um, so I will uh, send an email out to everyone with an example of my write-up for the uh, panels I gave today as well as a PDF of the, most of the slides I put together for the PowerPoint. Does anybody have any questions? Um, okay, so since I'm not seeing any and we're five minutes over, I'm going to go ahead and end the session. Um, there will be one more session in June, which will be other kind of classic but rare lesions. Is that okay with everyone? Please send me feedback if you have any. Thank, Thank you, Rachel.